Good evening, aspirants. Meeting you all after a long time. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis brought to you by Shankara Ace Academy. Today, I will be covering the Hindi News edition dated 2nd of December 2022. And I have taken these news articles for discussion. As promised yesterday by our faculty, I have taken 8 news articles for discussion. We will be covering them from the prelims perspective as well as mains perspective. And at the end, I also have a quiz question for you. So pay attention to the discussions. Our first discussion for today is going to be based on this news article taken from the Chennai edition. It mentions that the Tamil Nadu government has launched RFID technology for the supply chain management of blood and blood products. Can you recall what is this RFID? It is radio frequency identification. And we have heard about this term while learning about another system. It is the fast tag which is used for toll payments. But this news article reports about another application of this RFID. As per the news, Tamil Nadu government is planning to use this technology at two hospitals and it will be helpful in monitoring the use of stored blood and it will also prevent use of blood that has reached the expiry date. So that means what we need to know is the applications of RFID. To understand the applications of RFID, we need to understand what is this RFID. Radio Frequency Identification. See as the name indicates, this technology uses radio frequency for identification purposes. It is actually something similar to barcode reading. Here you can see the barcode. Normally we see the use of barcodes and barcode reader in supermarkets where they scan the barcode to know the details about the product. So this barcode system has two main components. First is the barcode which actually contains the information and second one is the barcode reader which retrieves the information stored in the barcode. But the point with barcodes is they need a direct line of sight between the reader and the barcode so that the information can be retrieved. This is one of the major disadvantages of barcode technology. Sometimes you would have seen in supermarkets that they will scan that barcode many times. This happens when there is no direct line of sight between the reader and the barcode. But this disadvantage with barcode is addressed through the use of RFID. See, even the RFID has two main components. But instead of barcode, here the RFID technology has a RFID tag. This tag stores the information. And then the next component is the RFID antenna. This antenna sends and receives the radio signals. So that means this antenna helps in retrieving the information stored in the RFID tag. So basically, both in barcode and RFID, in one component, the information is stored and the other component is used to retrieve that information. Okay, here you can see that the RFID antenna is connected to a storage device. This storage device is most probably a computer and this is the one that stores and analyzes the data retrieved from the RFID tag. Now since RFID antenna uses radio waves only, there is no need for a direct line of sight like in the case of barcodes. So I hope you got an idea about the major components in the RFID technology. Now let us see how it works. See first, a simple communication is established via the radio waves between the RFID tag and the antenna. And such RFID tags can either be passive or active. See the passive RFID tag does not have a power source of its own. So in the passive system, what happens is the antenna sends a radio signal to the tag and the passive RFID tag makes use of the received signal to activate itself and then sends the radio signal back to the antenna along with the information stored in it. And this information is received by the antenna. So you can see that this is a two-way communication. This is what happens in passive RFID tag. For example, if you take the fast tag which we saw in the beginning, it is a passive RFID tag only. Now the other type of RFID tag is the active RFID tag. This active tag has a power source attached to it. So it does not need a radio signal to activate itself. Hence in an active RFID system, the tag sends a radio signal to the reading antenna. So this is just a one-way communication. There is no two-way communication here. This kind of RFID tag is used to track mobile objects like cargo. Have you all recently watched the Lokesh Kanagaraj Tamil movie which is named Vikram? Kamal Hasan starred in it. In that movie, if you would have noticed, the consignment containing the drugs is tracked by switching on the power source of the active RFID tag placed inside it. I think you can get the connection here. Now in this table, I have displayed other differences between the active and passive RFID. You can just go through it. 
Now, since the article is about the applications of RFID, now we are going to see the applications. Mainly, the use of RFID technology in medical field. Okay. First, it is used in medical asset tracking. See, all the assets of the hospital, from beds to x-ray machines, are first equipped with RFID tags. And once this is done, the medical staff in the hospital can use the information, like its location or its availability, just by using a mobile or web application. So, this helps the medical staff in ensuring the availability of hospital assets to the patients. Then it also helps in medical inventory management. See, once the drugs and the medicines in the hospital are provided with the RFID tag, then the staff can get information on the location, quantity and even information on expiry dates of the medication. So using this information, the hospital staff can reduce search times and even minimize the medication shortage risks. Another major application is it is also used in avoiding infant mix-ups and infant abduction from hospitals. Have you ever visited any relative of yours who just had a baby? You would have noticed that in many of the private hospitals, they provide a tag which is tied up in their wrist. This is actually a RFID tag. What they do is, immediately after the childbirth, the mothers and the newborns will be given a similar RFID tag. So this helps in avoiding the infant mix-up in large hospitals. And further, this also helps in preventing child abduction. Similarly, RFID also has use in elderly care and uh, care for people with cognitive disorders because they tend to wander off site but when they use RFID tags on these elderly people or people with cognitive disorders it will help in tracking their real-time location what actually happens is if they move beyond a certain defined perimeter an alarm will go off to alert the hospital staff or the care facilities this similar technology is what is used in the case of newborn children to prevent abduction because when the child is taken out of a defined perimeter immediately the alarm will go off above all it also helps in you know improving the patient care how because many hospitals provides a rfid based wristband to the patients when they walk in the hospital so if that patient is waiting in an waiting area for longer time then the system immediately informs the staff and immediately an alternative is provided for the patient and this reduces the waiting time in hospitals and even the same RFID tag is embedded with the patient history also in some cases so the doctor by reading that RFID tag easily can get complete medical history of that patient other than the medical applications RFID is used in many other places also for example it is used in self check-in libraries even a metro card uses RFID technology it is used in livestock management then premium pet markets use it to identify pure breed animals. Even the baggage tracking at airports use this technology. Then industries also use it for asset tracking, inventory management, etc. Like this, RFID technology has many applications. And with the expected boom of uh, Internet of Things, we can say that the application that can be derived from this technology is limitless. So this was a comprehensive discussion about the RFID technology. We saw about the active and passive RFIDs. We saw how it differs from barcode technology. And we saw major applications of this technology in the medical field and even in other sectors. With this information, let us move on to the next article discussion. Let me take this article from Chennai edition. It reports about the shortfall in a particular vaccine supply in Tamil Nadu. The vaccine is the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Now, this shortfall has been notified to the central government by the state government. But why the central government is getting involved here? Before knowing that, from exam perspective, let us know about the pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. See, since the pandemic hit the world, we are talking about vaccines a lot. The one mentioned in news is a, another type of vaccine called as the conjugate vaccine. So, those who have been watching our analysis regularly, they know that there are many types of vaccine. We have the live attenuated vaccine, inactivated vaccine, mRNA vaccines, recombinant protein vaccines, subunit vaccines, polysaccharide vaccines, etc. And this conjugate vaccine which I am talking about is this polysaccharide vaccine only. So, what are these polysaccharides? They are the complex sugars on the surface of bacteria. They are actually an outer coating on the surface of the bacteria and this type of coating disguises the antigen. If the antigen is disguised, then can our immune system recognize it? No. But on the other hand, when the antigen attacks 
a human body there is a need for our immune system to react to this complex sugars rather than the proteins but unfortunately what happens in the case of young child is the child's immature immune system cannot recognize it and cannot respond to it but even before knowing this fact the polysaccharide vaccines were created and the scientists were confused as to why these vaccines are not working on babies and young children but after the realization that is after they got to know that the child's immature immune system cannot recognize it they created the conjugate vaccine do you know the literal meaning of conjugate it means connected or joined so the researchers discovered that the polysaccharide vaccines they worked much better if the polysaccharide was attached or when it was conjugated to something else and this conjugation creates a strong immune response now in most conjugate vaccines the polysaccharide is attached to diphtheria or tetanus toxoid protein but why these particularly because our immune system recognizes the toxoid let me take a detour and explain what is this toxoid as you know some bacteria release toxins and these toxins are poisonous proteins when they are released when they attack human body so that means our body has to protect us against these toxins rather than the bacteria itself now for our immune system to recognize these toxins some vaccines are made with inactivated versions of these toxins and they are only called as toxoids because they look like toxins but they are not poisonous they just trigger the strong immune response so when the polysaccharide is attached to diphtheria or tetanus toxoid protein our immune system recognizes the toxoid proteins of the diphtheria and tetanus so our body creates a stronger immune response to these toxoids and thereby a strong immune response is also generated against the polysaccharide why because the polysaccharide is attached to the toxoid protein that is why it is also not wrong to say that conjugate vaccines use some portions of the germ or bacteria here i have given a representation as you can see when only the polysaccharide is used there is no response but when the conjugate vaccine is used there is a proper response but the conjugate vaccine we want to know about is the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine now these vaccines they can prevent the illness caused by pneumococcal bacteria this bacteria is also called as streptococcus pneumoniae now these pneumococcal bacteria can cause many types of illnesses like they can cause an infection of the lungs also when it is an infection of the lungs we call it as pneumonia okay so who are vulnerable to this bacteria actually all ages particularly infants and the elderly people and the immunocompromised people now since children are easily affected by this bacteria prevention against it forms an important part of india's universal immunization program what is this universal immunization program or uip through this program our government provides free vaccination against vaccine preventable diseases these diseases include diphtheria polio measles etc and it also includes pneumonia now the vaccine that is available against the pneumococcal bacteria is the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine another important point regarding the uip program is as i said it is free vaccination so the vaccines are provided free of cost to the states through this only tamil nadu was also getting the pcv vaccine that is the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine but as per data the state government has received only 12.5 lakh doses out of 30 lakh doses this is even less than half and that is why now the issue has been reported to the central government you may think why they are not approaching the private sector for the vaccines it is because this pcv vaccine is quite costly now when the central government is providing it free of cost why do we need to buy it paying so much money so this is the issue reported in the news article now you should also know about the pcv vaccine that is how it is administered it is administered in three doses one dose at 6 weeks second one at 14 weeks and then when the child turns 9 months of age and since we are discussing about the pcv vaccine you have to know about india's first fully indigenously developed pcv it's named as pneumocil this was developed by serum institute of india and it was introduced in december 2020 okay so in this discussion we saw many facts related to conjugate vaccines we saw about uh, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and we also saw that it comes under the universal immunization program so if you have any doubts regarding this discussion post it in the comment section now let me take up the next news article
so now comes the text in context article it talks about global layoffs i think you are all aware that there were massive layoffs in many us multinational companies this includes even the tech giants like uh, amazon meta intel twitter and this has been happening for the past couple of months and that is why this article is written and it lists the reasons for such layoff and how global recession is related to this so we'll see all these aspects in this discussion let us begin with understanding the reason for the recent layoff to understand that we need to understand how a capitalistic economy functions normally so every country in the world has adopted capitalism in one form or another and for a capitalistic economy to grow there must be strong demand the subject of the economy that is people must have sufficient money and they must be willing to spend it only when there is enough demand the producers will be incentivized to produce more now to increase production they will invest in the economy and also hire new workers this in turn will increase the employment rate that means without proper demand in the economy a capitalistic economy cannot function okay but what is the present global scenario now there is an ongoing war between russia and ukraine and because of this russia is facing western sanctions and we know russia is an important petroleum and natural gas producer so due to this the fuel prices are increasing worldwide on the other hand ukraine which is a major exporter of wheat and edible oil is also reducing less due to the ongoing war so the food prices are also increasing worldwide now due to this increase in food and fuel prices inflation world over is increasing this increasing inflation is increasing the policy rate of the central banks like in india's case rbi has increased repo rate to reduce money supply in the economy so that they can control inflation now since the central banks have increased the policy rate the banks are increasing the rate at which they lend so people are finding it difficult to borrow when it is difficult to borrow it affects the consumption expenditure additionally the industries are also finding it difficult to borrow so this affects their ability to make new investments so that means both the demand in the economy and also the investment in the economy is coming down and when there is fall in fresh investment the employment rate is coming down in the economy in addition to all these the big mncs they are laying off employees to protect their profits so how this cycle is going basically there is rise in inflation due to russia ukraine war then this is causing uh, inflation due to which the central banks are increasing policy rate which is affecting the demand in the economy and due to increased policy rate there is low demand in the economy which is forcing the mncs to lay off employees okay so this is the reason for the recent layoffs by many tech giants in addition to this the article also points about another factor which is the economies of usa and europe are heading towards recession what is recession actually we cannot talk about recession in isolation we have to look at the entire business cycle to understand recession every modern economy goes through this cycle and this cycle involves four phases first is the prosperity phase or we can call it expansion or boom or upswing of economy in this phase the rate at which the economy grows keeps on increasing and in this phase only the demand keeps on increasing and even the investments are high so almost everyone in the economy will find employment then comes the recession phase in this phase the rate of the growth of the economy starts declining here you have to note one thing the economy is not contracting in this phase it is still growing but the rate at which the economy is growing decreases for example the growth rate of a country falls from 9% to 6% and then to 3% so we cannot say there is no growth at all but there is decreased growth so during this phase only demand slows down and industries stop the fresh hiring process and some even lay off employees so normally what the governments and central banks do they must take steps to raise the demand so if they fail to do so the economy will fall into the third stage which is depression so during depression the economy starts contracting additionally since already the demand is falling and in this depression phase it further falls down so the prices of goods and services also starts falling rapidly and that is why in this phase also there will be massive layoffs but if during this depression phase if the governments and central banks start intervening and take steps to increase the demand then the economy will start to grow again and when this happens we call it as the recovery phase why we call it as cycle 
because after this recovery then again there will be prosperity then recession then depression then recovery it goes on like this so i hope you got a basic understanding about recession so what will happen if as the article says the us and europe faces a recession what will be the impact in india it is a known fact that india's it services major export destination is the usa and europe so if there is a recession there then there will be low demand for it services from india and this will push indian it firms like tcs wipro infosys to lay off people in india and if they lay off people and they when they also do not generate any employment that means the unemployment rate in our country will increase so this is the major impact of recession for our country we can take the example of 2008 financial crisis here because at that time the us economy went into recession and we saw massive layoffs at that time also since now the experts are predicting that us and europe will go into recession now the government and the industry leaders of india are worried that the massive layoffs in the it sector will continue to happen so maybe in the future discussions we will see some of the steps that might be taken to address this problem okay i took this article for discussion just to make you understand how economy works what concepts we saw in this discussion we saw about the reason for layoffs we saw the business cycle which included the prosperity phase recession depression and recovery phase and finally we saw the major impact for india if there is recession in us and europe okay now let us take up the next news article now look at this article it says use your face as boarding pass but how is it possible this has been made possible through a new facility it is called as digi yatra facility so to understand what the news article says we need to understand about this facility first okay see in hindi yatra means travel so you should know that this digi yatra is related to air travel in this facility the airports digitally process the passengers so it gives a digital experience for air travelers and it is an industry led initiative surely it is also in line with digital india's vision what is this vision it is to transform india into a digitally empowered society now let me explain what is done through this digi yatra see first the passengers have to create a digi yatra id in a central system for this they have to provide their name email id mobile number and details of identity for this identity they can use voter id driving license aadhar card etc etc and when these details are provided the digi yatra id number will be created so when this id is created if you are booking an air ticket you can code this number so when you code this number along with your passenger details all this will be passed on to the departure airport by the airlines but on the first travel using this id the passenger has to go to the registration kiosk at the airport for validating the id here they will be validating your photo which will be then added to the digi yatra profile in the central system so once all these are done a one time registration is required on the app that is created for digi yatra and this one time registration is done using the aadhar based validation and a self image capture why image is important here see if your image is not uploaded how will the airport know that it is you who have booked the tickets okay now in the next step while you are at airport the boarding pass will be scanned and then the credentials will be shared with the airport at that point then you have to use the airport e gate here the passenger has to first scan the barcoded boarding pass then the facial recognition system which is installed at the e gate will validate the passenger's identity and the travel document and once this process is done the passenger can enter the airport through the e gate so you can understand that here the passenger will be automatically processed based on facial recognition system the same is applicable at various checkpoints in an airport like entry point check entry into the security check and even aircraft boarding and this will also facilitate self backdrop and self check in in the airport here also the passenger will be automatically processed using the facial recognition system okay another fact to be remembered is the personally identifiable information that is your personal data your name phone number etc it will not be stored in any central storage rather the passenger's id and travel credentials will be stored in a secure wallet on your smartphone itself now this digi yatra platform was built on four key pillars they are connected passengers connected airports connected flying and connected systems so it has connected everything related to your air travel now this digi yatra will be implemented in a phased manner and for that the airport authority of india 
will identify the airports so what is today's news then it says that passengers who are traveling from delhi varanasi and bengaluru will be able to use this facility from december onwards that is it is available from yesterday december 1 and soon it is expected that this facility will be made operational at other major airports but is it mandatory to use the service actually no it is voluntary in nature maybe in the future it may be made mandatory also note that currently this facility will be available only for domestic flights and before concluding what are the facts you need to remember digi yatra is a digital facility that will make your air travel much comfortable and easier it will use facial recognition technology because this will only recognize your face and then only the passenger details will be processed automatically and the next factors it is voluntary in nature and to use this facility you have to create a digi yatra id okay i hope the facts are clear here with this information we are moving on to the next news article discussion our next discussion is going to be based on this article from the business page this snippet article mentions about a white paper published by world economic forum in collaboration with niti aayog see so this paper deals with the complete electrification of india's entire fleet of two wheelers and three wheelers according to the white paper this electrification of india's two wheelers and three wheelers will require about 285 billion dollars so while calculating this amount the paper has listed many of the hurdles in india's electric vehicle sector so that is what we are going to see today actually why anyone should go for electric vehicle because it provides low cost zero emission mobility to people based on this one major advantage of electric vehicles even the government of india is focusing on innovative policy measures and we also have national flagship schemes to scale up electric mobility in our country you know the fame scheme and the fame 2 scheme right it is formulated to promote the manufacturing of electric and hybrid vehicle but there are many hurdles or issues in india's electric vehicle sector the first among them is the capital flow to the electric vehicle ecosystem that is the fund needs to grow multifold this will require de-risking of markets through deeper collaboration between stakeholders and business model innovation and all this in turn will help in reducing the cost of the electric vehicles also and secondly there is also lack of confidence in the new technology lately we are seeing electric scooters catching fire so there is lack of confidence among the consumers as well as the manufacturers the third hurdle is the unassured reliability see whether the electric vehicle will perform well and the safety related concerns makes us question the reliability of the electric vehicles so this is the third hurdle the fourth one is the unestablished resale value of electric vehicles see the residual value of electric vehicles need to be established first what is the residual value it is the future value of the vehicle after it is used by the owner for some period so only if you know this residual value you can be sure of the resale value of that vehicle so if you want to sell it after use of 3 to 4 years it should be profitable and if the residual value is established and then it is expected that this will have a positive impact on purchasing decisions of the consumers another hurdle is there is no long term policy road map the fame scheme provides demand incentives demand incentive is nothing but providing incentive to create the demand for example under the fame scheme the incentive will be provided in the manner of reduction in the cost of the electric vehicle so you will get a particular discount with respect to every electric vehicle product and when such kinds of incentives are provided the demand rises for that product and when there is high demand it will attract greater investments but the hurdle is there is no long term policy in this regard according to the white paper by world economic forum another major issue is the domestic banks lack understanding of the technology and the associated risks see they need to understand the technology to set the loan limit that they can provide only then the gig workers who have uh, limited credit history or no formal credit history can avail financial help from the banks other than this there is also lack of support with respect to vehicle leasing or individual ownership another major hurdle we all know that insufficient infrastructure that is the insufficient charging infrastructure and the one that is provided also lacks diversity to accommodate various types of electric vehicles so all these hurdles need to be addressed first so that india can reach a full electrification of its two wheelers and three wheelers okay all these points will help you in your mains answer writing 
so that's all about this discussion let us take up the next news article now this detailed article from delhi edition talks about the freshwater turtles see this article reports about the struggle of conservationists and government departments in preventing the smuggling of turtles within the country and outside the country it also reports about the challenges faced by these officials in rehabilitating the turtles which are recovered from anti trafficking operations so interested aspirants can actually go through this article it is quite interesting but from exam perspective we'll just have a brief about freshwater turtles in india see turtles they belong to one of the oldest reptile groups in the world and they are distinctive animals belonging to the riverine and wetland ecosystem it requires specific habitats and they have physical and ecological adaptations for freshwater habitat generally turtles can be herbivores carnivores or omnivores in nature and as you know turtles breathe air and they lay their egg on land another interesting fact about turtles is they have incredibly long life span because of some reasons first is they are cold blooded and second is they have very slow metabolism so they can survive without food and water for a long time and they can also survive in harsh conditions all these adds to their life span now with respect to india you should know that we have 24 species of freshwater turtles here i have a question for you can you mention one difference between a turtle and a tortoise post it in the comment section now many of the turtle species are threatened therefore they enjoy high protection in our country actually 11 turtle species are protected under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act of 1972 so what are the threats faced by these freshwater turtles the major one is illegal trading so they are illegal traded as pets they are traded for food and even to prepare medicines for example it is said that a gelatinous layer which is found in the lower shells of the turtle is believed to be used in traditional chinese medicine this gelatinous layer is called as turtle calipi so for this purpose they are illegally traded especially the demand for freshwater turtles and their body parts sees a spike every year during winter because it is easier to transport animals for extended periods in winter and another major threat is habitat loss and this is the same for majority of these species now here i have given the turtle species found in india and also their iucn status you can just go through it as you can see many of these turtles are either vulnerable or critically endangered for example this black soft shell turtle is critically endangered the indian flap shell turtle is listed as vulnerable so this table will help you to comprehensively understand the threat faced by this species okay you can pause the video and go through it or you can also find this data in the pdf file that is given in the description of this video so with this information we are moving on to the next news article discussion now after these many articles now let me take up an editorial for discussion this editorial talks about the issue of judicial appointments to the top courts of our country yes we discussed this issue yesterday also but yesterday we saw some basics like uh, about njac and the collegium system you can go through that analysis to have an idea about njac and collegium but what was the main issue the issue was union government returned the names of nearly 19 judges who were recommended by the collegium for the appointment as judges in various high courts so we dealt with this issue yesterday but in today's discussion based on this editorial article we'll see whether such recommendations made by the collegium is binding or not we'll also see the memorandum of procedure which governs the collegium system okay now before getting into the discussion this is the syllabus that can be linked to this discussion you can just go through it here two judgments are important for us one is the judgment in the second judges case and then the judgment in the third judges case because this only gave birth to the collegium system but to understand the issue between the judiciary and the union government we need to have a full understanding about appointment cycle of judges for the constitutional courts constitutional courts are nothing but the supreme court and the high courts okay because they are established according to the constitutional provisions now first the collegium recommends the list of names of judges which it thinks as fit for appointment as judges for high courts and supreme court this recommendation is made to the government then the government goes through the names and finalizes whether they are fit for appointment after finalizing it will recommend those names to the president now the president will appoint those as judges who are recommended by the government okay this is the normal procedure but whether it is necessary for the government to accept the recommendation by the collegium actually in the first instance it is not 
mandatory because when for the first time the recommendation is made government can return the names back to the collegium this can be done only if it finds any objections to the names proposed but along with the objected names the government should also give the reasons for such objections now the collegium will go through the reasons for non approval of the names but if the collegium thinks that the names are fit to be recommended then it will retrade the same names to the government this is where the judgment in the second judge's case is important because as per this judgment when the collegium retrades the same names then the government has to forward the names to the president for appointment what this line means this means the re recommendation of the names is binding on the government this also means that the government has the power only to ask the collegium to reconsider the proposed names and that to only once if the same name is reiterated then the government has no other option other than forwarding it to the president okay but why this procedure this is to make sure that the judiciary will have primacy over the government in matters of appointments and transfers because this only will enable the judiciary to remain independent of the government and thereby remaining independent of the executive by having primacy over the appointments and transfers the judiciary safeguards its independency i hope it is clear but what happened recently was when the government returned 19 names back to the collegium 10 names were re recommended but rather than recommending these names to the president what the government did was it returned the names to the collegium again so that means the government did not obey the supreme court judgment and that is why this is seen as a serious issue now one of the reasons given for this action of government is sometimes it doesn't like the names which are sent by the collegium and that is why it either returns back the names or it just does not do anything that is no action is taken now based on the actions of the government the author has raised one of the major concerns which is if this keeps on happening the government will eventually change the court's behavior to be conducive to the whims of the government if the court starts acting on the whims of the government what will happen there will not be an independent judiciary this was what happened in hungarian poland where the courts were brought under the control of the government itself for example if you take hungary here see in the past several years the government of hungary was following many undemocratic practices and among them was the attack on the independence of judiciary where the hungarian government altered the rules around judicial appointments and such rules paved way to fill the vacancies with political appointees in the judiciary so if the issue between the indian government and the supreme court of india is not solved then a similar thing can also happen in our country okay but in the beginning i also said that we'll see a memorandum of procedure that governs the collegium system what is this memorandum of procedure it is a document framed by the government in consultation with the chief justice of india this document lays down the procedure for the appointment of judges to the supreme court and also to the various high courts it was first issued in 1947 and since then it has been updated many times so because of this over the years many memorandum of procedure has continuously evolved this forms the basis of step by step selection process for appointment of judges and this process involves both the government and also the collegium system and that is why this functions as a crucial document but why do we need a memorandum of procedure when we have a collegium system already it is because collegium system of appointing judges is a judicial innovation it is not mandated through any legislation or a text of the constitution that is why this memorandum of procedure was framed it just forms part of the checks and balances between the judiciary and the executive there is another reason why this mop that is memorandum of procedure holds importance see it removes the ambiguities and even it promotes a consensus oriented appointment process through a mutually agreed code and when was this mop renegotiated recently it was after the njac that is national judicial appointments commission was struck down by the supreme court this mop also gives a general time frame within which the government need to take action on the recommendation of the collegium also note that we have separate mops for the appointment of supreme court judges and for the appointment of high court judges even though we have a collegium system and then we have a mop to govern it still there are many concerns regarding judicial appointments the major concern is the opaqueness of collegium system even recently you would have heard that the union law minister made a strong comment on this issue 
he said that the judges appointment by the collegium are steeped in nepotism so actually what is the way out of this tussle two to three things can be done here first the judiciary should reform itself because it is not allowing the government to make any reformation it already struck down the njac the second idea would be the creation of a new mop and such new mop should incorporate the legitimate concerns of the government as well as other stakeholders because the collegium system is not only criticized by the government but also by those who are within the judicial system so these are the two ideas given by the author of this editorial to solve the issue of judicial appointments so you have to combine today's discussion with yesterday's discussion to understand many points and i hope when in the future a final decision is made in this matter by the judiciary or the government will have a more clear picture on the issue so with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article it is with reference to the koya tribes the article mentions that the gutti koya tribe who are present in the northern and eastern districts of telangana are provided with eviction notices see this has been done after an untoward incident which resulted in the killing of a forest officer last month now the gutti koya tribe is a subgroup under the koya tribe so let us revise few facts about the koya tribe from prelims point of view koya tribe is the largest adivasi tribe of telangana they are also present in the adjoining telugu speaking state of andhra pradesh majorly they are found in northern andhra pradesh and some population of the tribe is also present in far southern chhattisgarh and southwestern odisha see the koyas you know they mainly inhabited the hilly areas of west godavari east godavari khammam and uh, varangal district and they are also sparsely found in the adilabad and karimnagar districts of telangana actually they call themselves koitor in their own dialect what is their dialect it is the koya dialect but some have even uh, adopted telugu as their mother tongue one interesting fact we can note with respect to the social culture of koya they accept levirate marriage levirate marriage is nothing but a type of marriage in which the brother of a deceased man is obliged to marry his brother's widow that is simply a widow would marry her dead husband's brother along with it they follow both monogamy and polygamy now with respect to the economic activities which the koyas are involved you need to know that they are settled cultivators they grow jowar ragi bajra and other millets and most of the koyas who live in the middle of the forest they also collect tubers and roots and edible green leaves now they are mainly settled cultivators because their lands are very fertile due to the periodical floods in the godavari river when we talk about any tribal group their festivities are also important for us so you need to know that they perform a robust colorful dance called parma kok atta it is also called as bison horn dance which they perform during festivals and marriage ceremonies other than this medaram jatra is celebrated by the koya tribe actually this is the second largest fair of india after kumbh mela this is celebrated by the tribe for four days so these are few facts that is relevant for upsc exams so with this we are coming to the end of article discussion session now we are moving to the prelims practice question session let me take up this first question it is a pair based question on one side famous tribes are given and on the other side we can find the states which they belong to we have to find how many pairs are correctly matched the first pair koya telangana this is correct we saw this during discussion now the second pair todas madhya pradesh this is incorrect because toda people are dravidian ethnic group they live in nilgiri mountains of tamil nadu they do not have any linkages to central india so since one pair is incorrect we can eliminate option d now come to the third pair it is correct sitivas they are also known as lalung tribe they are the indigenous community living in northeastern region they live in assam meghalaya arunachal pradesh manipur and nagaland now finally kuki mizoram we know this is correct kuki people are ethnic group who are native to the mizo hills they are found in mizoram as well as in the adjoining manipur so the correct answer to this question is option c only three pairs now let us take up this next question which among the following reports are released by world economic forum global gender gap report global information technology report global human capital report world economic forum as you know is a non profit organization founded in 1971 it releases many reports like environmental performance index global competitive index and along with that it releases all these three also so the correct answer is option d 1 2 and 3 now this is a previous year question that came in 2021 prelims the question asks with reference to recent developments regarding recombinant vector vaccine 
consider the following statements. Statement 1 is genetic engineering is applied in the development of these vaccines. See these recombinant vector vaccines, they are live replicating viruses. These viruses are engineered to carry extra genes derived from a pathogen and these extra genes produce proteins against which a body generates immunity. So genetic engineering is definitely involved in the development of these vaccines. So statement 1 is correct. Now second statement, bacteria and viruses are used as vectors. As a result of advances in the fields of molecular biology and genetic engineering, it is now possible to use bacteria and viruses as vectors. So this statement is also correct. Now in this table, I have given the bacteria and viruses that have been already used as vectors for this type of vaccine. This includes Mycobacterium bovis BCG, Listeria, Monocytogenes, Salmonella, Shigella, and then some viral vectors include Vaccinia, Modified Vaccinia virus, Ankara, Adenovirus, Adeno-associated virus, Retrovirus, Alpha virus, Herpes virus, etc. This table provides just some of the examples, okay? Now here, the question asks us to choose the correct statements. And since both the statements are correct, the correct answer is both 1 and 2. Now let us take up this next question. Which of the following is or are the benefits of Dijayatra? We saw about Dijayatra. Now let us go through these options and find out which are correct. First, paperless travel. Second, more human intervention. Third, enhanced security. See, paperless travel is correct because it relies on automatic processing and it uses facial recognition technology. And using the app and the Digi Yatra ID, we can cross the checkpoints. It is paperless travel because everything is linked to the Digi Yatra ID, which will be provided also in our boarding pass. So this is correct. Second one, more human intervention. This is actually incorrect because just now I said it involves facial recognition technology for automatic processing. So it avoids identity check at multiple points. And therefore, there is minimum human intervention. Due to this, the queuing time in airport will also be less. This is an additional advantage. So, 2 is incorrect. Third one, enhanced security. Obviously, because since facial recognition technology is involved, the airport operator will have a real-time information on passenger load. And they will also know where every passenger is in the airport. Okay. Now, since the airport operator has all the information, resource planning also becomes better in this case. So, the correct answer to this question will be 1 and 3 only, which is option A. So, with this prelims question, we have come to the end of practice prelims question discussion session. Now, let me take the quiz question for you today that you have been waiting. This is the quiz question. Which of the following occurs along with economic growth? Interested aspirants, read the question carefully and you can post the answer in the comment section. I will tell you whether your answer is right or not. Along with this, I also have a mains question. Actually, I have two mains questions today. One is from GS paper 3 and other is from GS paper 2. And those who want to write answer to this question, they can also post the mains answer in the comment section. Whenever we get time, we will review your answer. With this, we have come to the end of Hindiness analysis for 2nd December. I hope you enjoyed this session and learned a lot. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button. And also subscribe to our channel if you have not yet subscribed. Thank you for listening.